Hi, I'm Deboki and this is Okie Doki Boki, and today I am very excited to be talking about my plans for Nonfiction November. Nonfiction November is hosted by Olive over at A Book Olive, so I'm going to link to her announcement video down below um, where there's like more information. Basically, the goal is just to read more nonfiction. It's been going on for a few years, and in the past few years, I've sort of just kind of like lightly dipped my toes in it. Like I think some years I'll get to the end of November and I'll be like, oh cool, I read some nonfiction. I'm gonna talk about it now. This year I'm trying to be a little bit more concerted about it because I have so many nonfiction books that I need to get to, that I need to read and I really really would like to just force myself to sit down and read them. Force isn't the right word. These are books that I want to read. I just keep getting distracted so I feel like this will be a good month to kind of focus on, on getting through that list. I don't really do TBRs on this channel um, like at all and I think I talked about this in a previous video once. It's because TBRs stress me out. They feel like way too much pressure. It's science you know like if you if you say out loud that you want to read a certain book you are never gonna read that book. Or at least if you are like me, this is a thing that happens. So to kind of like deal with these probabilities and like trick the TBR curse, I am basically going to be listing off a whole bunch of books that I know that like there is no way I'm going to be completing all of these in November, but that I feel like by listing them all, I will at least get to a few of them. So I'm gonna start with my TBR, but at the end of this, I'm also going to be recommending some books that if you are looking for ideas for nonfiction November or just in general, if you are interested in reading more nonfiction overall and are looking for ideas, um, yeah, the, I'm just gonna list some of my favorite nonfiction books towards the end of this video. So yeah, both some things that I'm reading and some things that I think you should read. First, let's get to the science books. The list of science books that I need to get to is kind of embarrassing as someone who works as a science writer. There are a lot of books that are on my shelf and I am going to pretend that there are only three. So the first book is The Tangle Tree by David Quammen. This is a book about the history of evolution very loosely. And when I say the history, I mean both our understanding of it, but also like of evolution itself. And I am boiling that down to be a very succinct phrase, but it's actually much more complicated than that, which is part of the point of the book. A lot of the things that we have boiled down to be so simple, almost like mechanistic in terms of our understanding of genetics and heredity are actually much more complicated, especially when you look in the very, 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 very long term, like billions and billions and of billions of years of evolution. I had asked a friend for recommendations about books about like ecology and microbes, and this is one of the ones he recommended, um, like that's more um, relevant to microbes and I was like well cool gonna check this out so I actually bought it and I'm now working my way through it the next book um, which is truly embarrassing for how long that I have like had it in my possession and haven't actually gotten to read it is I Contain Multitudes by Ed Young if you've heard me talk about science writing at all or science writers you've probably heard me mention Ed Young he's one of my favorite science writers I really like his writing style and the way that he explains things you can always tell an Ed Young headline like it's just got a very distinct literary whatever kind of style but like in an accessible way. I Contain Multitudes also about microbes but more about like communities and microbes especially the microbiome. So I will say this is a shameless plug for the thing that I work on. If you are also interested in microbes um, or if you don't know anything about microbes or if you're like curious about any of the things that I'm talking about right now, um, the, the project that I've been working on is Journey to the Microcosmos. It's a YouTube channel um, put out by Complexly. It's really awesome like as someone who's coming from not researching microbes, like my, my PhD was like working with T cells, with like m human T cells. Um, it's been like a huge shift to be like, oh wow, there's this, this cool other invisible world out there and the microscopy videos that um, James provides are gorgeous anyways that's my shameless plug the last science book for now though again I have many others on my shelves that I need to get to and so maybe those will show up during the month um, but this book is How Charts Lie by Alberto Cairo I received this as an arc from the publisher WW Norton when I saw this in their catalog I was super excited. This book is basically all about data visualization, but in particular how data visualization can lead you wrong. Like how graphs, how things that we associate with like giving us concrete objective information can be designed in ways that actually belie their subjectivity. There are things that you can do with like what types of data you're presenting, how you're presenting it, how you're interpreting it. Like all of these things can come together in a way that's actually pretty tricky. And I was just like, please, I really want to read this. So this 
book actually came out October 15th, so it is available. I've started reading it and I'm really enjoying it. It's kind of like reading a picture book, if like a picture book for, for grown-ups who really want to look at graphs all day. Um, there's just really beautiful, like just the way that they've presented graphs is really nice and how they integrate that with like the lessons. But I feel like it's good for like a, if I've been reading too much stuff that's like, information dense this still has a lot of information but because of the way it's parsed out i think it'll be like kind of a nice lighter read sometimes when you say lighter it sounds like you're denigrating like the the actual content i think this book is actually really important and i think what it has will probably be really important it too um it's just that the way it's presented is smartly i think presented in a way that is approachable and kind of feels almost casual even if the content itself is not casual it is actually maybe kind of like borderline life or death for society as a whole moving on from science is like a category that's more maybe broadly about culture um in like pop culture but that also kind of has its own subsections so starting off the first book is beyond heaving bosoms by sarah wendell and candy tan i've never said bosoms out loud before but that's kind of a fun word to say i think titties is like one of the best words like to say out loud it's got so many t's in it um and so bosoms is like in that category they're so much better than saying breasts or boobs beyond heaving bosoms about the history of romance novels also a book that I've had on my shelves for an embarrassingly long amount of time and I'm really excited to get into it it combines a lot of things that I'm excited about romance novels dissecting romance novels and like putting them against like you know the broader place and culture and history next up are two books that are I think probably on a lot of people's radars um they kind of pair up under a general category of accountability in culture um and this is She Said by Jodi Cantor and Megan Toohey and Catch and Kill by Ronan Farrow these are both books about basically Harvey Weinstein written by the reporters um jo Jodi Cantor and Megan Toohey are from the New York Times Ronan Farrow is from the New Yorker so they're writing both about Harvey Weinstein as well as the process of reporting these stories which I think it also involves kind of how Harvey Weinstein's team tried to shut down the survivors um, who were making these allegations. Like a lot of people, I've been, I've been following the Harvey Weinstein story. I've been really like interested in it. Interested is always like a weird word to use in these contexts, but like I'm basically interested in there actually being a sense of accountability and whether that will happen is one story, but just even having these things brought to light is a big deal. And so for me, reading these stories is kind of part of that. And when the New York Times and the New Yorker both published their stories about Harvey Weinstein, having different outlets approach the story really gave different angles to what had happened in this long history of Harvey Weinstein's abuse. And I get the feeling that the books will be the same way. Next up are some essays. Um, first is The White Album by Joan Didion. It's a Joan Didion collection, also a book that I've had on my shelves for a while. So I, I need to do it. I'm also just like really in an essay mood right now. I think partly that's because of Gia Tolentino's Trick Mirror, which like really got me like back into like loving essays and remembering what it is I love about reading essays. So I'm kind of like, well, you know, Joan Didion was like the one who first got me into reading essays. Maybe I should do this. The other essay collection that I really want to read is I Like to Watch by Emily Nussbaum. I had a weekend recently where like this this book came up multiple times, including Nicole over at Sweeney Says. She recommended it. Emily Nussbaum is a well-regarded TV critic. This is an essay collection about TV criticism. So yeah. I, I love that stuff. Just give me all your essay collections about pop culture and TV and what you're watching and I will gladly just sit there and soak it in. The last book that I like formally have on my TBR, which is not in any of these categories, um, but I'm planning to listen to as an audiobook, is Say Nothing, A True Story of Murder and Memory in Northern Ireland by Patrick Radden Keefe. As you can tell from that title, this is a book about a murder in Northern Ireland, but I think it's also about the Troubles, which is a period of history that I really know little about, so I've been wanting to learn more. On Twitter a while ago, I'd posted that I was looking for recommendations for good nonfiction reads on audiobook, and Jacqueline from Six Minutes for Me recommended this. Claire over at Claire Reads Books also reviewed this book in a wrap-up video, and I was really intrigued by the way she described it there. So I'm really interested in reading this book because it's about a subject I know basically nothing about. I'm very 
much looking forward to having this huge gap in my knowledge filled in and hopefully being slightly less ignorant about this subject. Okay, and to wrap up, I promised some recommendations. Some of these books are ones that I like recommend anytime like there's a question on a tag or whatever about like books that I think everyone should read or like books that people don't know about or whatever, um, just because I think they're super, super good and also super, super important. So. I am putting that out there again because until you all read these books, I will not shut up about them. The first is The Making of Asian America by Erica Lee. It's actually right here. If I were less lazy, I would like bring it out and show you and wave it around. The Making of Asian America is a history of immigration to the US from a number of different Asian countries. If you're like me and you are <laughs> Asian in some way, there's a chance that you hear this title and your first impulse is like, how can she possibly cover the entire Asian American experience? The goal is not to cover the entire Asian American experience. The goal is to track how different situations going on in different Asian countries shape the experiences of their immigrants to America and how that's had an impact long term in the development of this country because based on its immigrants. For me, it was like the first book I read that really gave me a sense of place and history in this country. I know a lot of other first gen kids, it can sometimes feel like you don't really have a history because you don't necessarily feel like connected to your ancestral country, but you don't also feel connected to American history. So like, for me, this was the book that like gave me that sense of like, Oh, this is the this is the tradition that I'm a part of. I also read this book before the 2016 election. It was the book that like most informed the way that I viewed what Trump was doing at that time and a lot of the immigration rhetoric that's happened since. Another book, and this is definitely more of a niche book, um, but I would recommend it for anyone who is interested in this niche. This is the Scientific Literature, A Guided Tour. Also right here. Um, this is a kind of like a collection history, I guess, of scientific publishing starting with the Royal Society and the Royal and like letters that scientists would send in Europe to each other to share their discoveries. It gives examples of different, you know, parts of scientific publishing over time, how the trends have changed. If you've read any older papers, you know that they read very, very, very differently than the papers that are published today. Like I remember I was taking a class in grad school where we read a paper that I think was published in like the 50s and that read so, so differently than the papers that like we, we publish nowadays. Um, so that was sort of the trigger for what got me interested in this subject. And someone recommended this book like to learn more about it. It's kind of built around examples from papers that are technical, but the book itself is not overly technical. Like it says in the title, it's a guided tour. So I think it's like a very nice, easy kind of like, yeah tour through the history of scientific publishing. Another recommendation, uh, Truck Mirror by Gia Tolentino. I talked about this in a wrap up. I really, really enjoyed it. Gia Tolentino is, I really love the way that she writes essays. I like the way that she is able to apply nuance to a lot of topics that you might not always expect nuance around. And yeah, I just really, really like her writing. So I'll link to my wrap up if you want to hear more of my thoughts about it. Um, but I, she's the thing that, she's the writer who got me kind of like wanting to revisit essays this year. So for me, that's sort of like a testament to why I recommend her. Related to that is another essay collection. This is The Collected Schizophrenias by uh, Esme Weijin Wang. In this book, Wang basically is writing essays about her experience with a, a schizophrenia diagnosis. Everything from like relationships to diagnosis to makeup and fashion. There's just a breadth of topics that she's approaching in this collection. I think the choice to make this an essay collection is super interesting. It allows her to sort of jump around in topics in ways that can feel a little bit abrupt and kind of hard to fully understand what's happening in the book. But I think that that is somewhat of the point. And I think the choice to, to, to do it this way versus writing maybe like a more expected memoir is really fascinating. And I, I think it adds to the collection overall. I don't think this is like the easiest collection to read, not just because like the subject matter is intense, but also because like, like I said, the topics do jump around a bit, but the language and the topics and the arguments are all themselves very clear. And that gives you something really e like easy to hold on to, even as Wang jumps around from like story to story in a way that you're still kind of waiting for things to tie together. This is not a collection about easy answers. It's more about the questions themselves of having this diagnosis and how she approaches it and how like even that is a sh constantly shifting thing. So that's something that I think is really sometimes hard to grasp in, in books. Like we want these memoirs and like essays to like have a clear answer, 
but they don't. And, and I respect that this collection is not indulging us like as the reader in trying to like make us believe that there are easy answers when there clearly aren't. Next book, Know My Name by Chanel Miller. Before the publishing of this book, Chanel Miller was probably best known as Emily Doe, um, the victim of uh, Brock Turner's rape, attempted rape, whatever your semantics, legal semantics are, um, of her uh, near a dumpster at a after a Stanford party. In the aftermath of the rape, Brock Turner had basically been kind of described in the news often as this swimmer whose chances at making it to the Olympics had now been dashed by this horrible thing that was maybe just like a little blip kind of in his life or should have been a blip. And that was part of the factors that led to a very lenient sentencing, which triggered a lot of outrage, combined with Chanel Miller's very powerful victim impact statement. And I remember reading her victim in impact statement and like her writing in that is just, it's incredible. The way that she expresses herself, the way she expresses her rage, the way she expresses her sadness, the way that she like, describes the impact that everything's had on her family like it is so raw and powerful and like just very vividly stated. This memoir was announced with like not that much lead up to the actual publishing and it's the first time that her name was like revealed on her own terms um, and I was like I'm I'm gonna read it like like I just felt like I can't not read it and so I started reading this book and I was like it's probably gonna be you know pretty intense I'm probably gonna have to like read it in like bits and pieces and that was not my experience at all. I ended up just like fully binging this book in one go. I don't know if people describe reading books in one go in one sitting as like binging, but that's what it felt like. I just like, I started it and I just, I had to read the whole thing. But a big part of like why I just blew through this book in one sitting was because Chanel Miller is a very good writer she, and she's very good at telling a story. The way that she's able to describe her own feelings, the way that she's able to connect them to broader cultural issues, the way that she's able to bring in ties to other events that have happened in her life, whether it's a string of suicides in her high school to a shooting at the UCSB campus when she was a college student. She ties them all together so that the book is like, it's, it is about her personal experience, but her personal experience is also a lens to understand the broader culture that makes issues of survival and rage and rape all tied together. I do want to say though that just because I was able to blow through this book despite how intense it is that might not be your experience so definitely go in with like your eyes wide open that this is a book that talks about rape and trauma and survival and like also like suicide and mass shootings and other things. Lastly, another book that like I recommend to everyone, even though I think it's a little bit harder to get, this is as It Does Not Die by Matri Devi. This is a memoir written by a woman who had found herself the subject of someone's fictionalized version of her slash his life. In the early 20th century, Matri Devi was a student of Rubin the Tagore, who is not just like a famous Bengali poet, he is like the famous Bengali poet. So her dad was a teacher, sometimes students would come stay with him, including this Romanian student who ended up in a secret sort of forbidden relationship with her. And that ended up not, you know, going so great. Um, but when he returned to Romania, he wrote this book um, called Bengal Nights, which contains a fictionalized version of their relationship. And she read that decades later and was like, fuck that. And she wrote her own version, which is It Does Not Die. I have not read Bengal Bengal Nights yet. I feel like I should because I, I'm curious about how they pair up, but It Does Not Die is amazing. If you've ever wanted to read a woman take on the fictionalized accounting of her life, this is the book for you. Maybe like she is filtering it through a lens of her own respectability and presentation. Um, that is sort of like an interesting aspect of the book, but I think it's also like a really compelling book beyond that. It touches a lot on like Bengali culture, on marriage, on love, about the time in Indian history that she was growing up in, which is like a very turbulent time where a lot of things were changing. So I just really love this book. I finally bought a copy for myself because I was like, if this ends up just vanishing from the earth and I don't have my own copy, I'm going to be devastated. So I bought it. I have it. Probably will reread it at some point because I just love it so much. So that is my TBR slash recommendations. Happy nonfiction November. I am excited to see what everybody reads. I'm also nervous because it also means that I'm going to end up with like 50 more books that I want to read. But that's okay. That's the point of this month. The point is that there's a lot of great nonfiction writers and we should read more of their stuff. So yeah, thank you guys for watching and bye. Mm -hmm.